when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. <laughs> Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecute the prophets who are before you. Amen. The word of God. Let us pray. Oh, Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. What I want to do today is take two things, two halves, and put them together in a way that uh, is different, but I think clarifies what it means to be a Christian. I think most of us have a general idea of our judicial system, how it's structured. But once a person is charged with a crime, they're brought before the judge, and the evidence is presented, and the judge eventually makes a determination. If the person is found guilty, a sentence is imposed. However, the judge has some flexibility in the punishment given. And occasionally, instead of applying the harshest judgment, the judge may decide instead to provide probation as an alternative. Now, probation is a specific length of time in which the person's behavior is supervised to make sure they stay on the right track. In addition, sometimes the judge may require community service or financial restitution that is paying back for the damages the person has caused. And ideally, the time of probation, the person lives a life free of criminal offenses. And upon successfully completing probation, probation, the person's free. That's the first half. I'd like to put the second half together with the first. I believe there's a parallel, a parallel pattern in the way our relationship with God is acted out by God and by us. You know the outline. You know the outline of the relationship, how according to the biblical story, we were originally in right relationship with God. But then, out of our pride and self-centeredness, we decided that we would declare our independence and we could go it alone, go it alone. And going it alone, in spite of God's wishes, it's called sin. And the penalty for sin, according to the Bible, is spiritual death. Now here we, at that point, are under the sentence of death. But then, something amazing happens. That amazing thing is the fact that God of his mercy sends his son Jesus. And Jesus takes our penalty of spiritual death upon himself and in his death sets us free that's the end of the story because then you and i having been set free of our debt are on probation you and i look at us we're all on probation that means in the light of what god has done for us we're supposed to live our lives on good behavior, on God's good behavior, what God would have us to. That means we are in the situation we find ourselves. Christ has done so much for us. How amazing is this gift of his own life for us. How do you ever repay that? The psalmist in the Old Testament says, Oh Lord, how shall we pay you for all your goodness unto us? And the answer is, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. So we will dramatize what it means for us to recognize that God has done this for us, that Christ has died for us. As we gather around this table, we remember what that means for us and how that has changed our lives. Well, now we find ourselves as those who as Christian probationers have to be faithful to our probationary terms. Here's what we have to do. 
while we're on this probation for the rest of our lives. We have to enter it with a spirit of thanksgiving. We would be spiritually dead if we're not for the gift of Christ. And so our hearts and lives are thankful for God's great gift. Love mercy, says the prophet Micah. So God's mercy is something we do love and imitate. Because you see, we've escaped spiritual death. Jesus has assumed, assumed that for us. And we live now because he died for us. And we have to live thankful lives. It's inevitable. It's not something we do out of a mandate. It's something our hearts prompt us to do. So great is the love of Christ for each one of us. So that's the first thing. We live thankful lives. And the second, we have to know what God requires of us. And the kids heard it today. We have to act justly. Christians have long been noted for doing that, for standing up, acting justly in a world that is too often unjust. And then we're told to love mercy, love it enough from Christ to give it to others. Jesus tells us again and again that's what we're supposed to do. That having been forgiven, we ourselves are so grateful we have to go out and forgive those who sinned against us and to walk humbly with God. That is to try to imitate Jesus in every way we can. And that's what it's about. How do we know how to do that? How to walk humbly with our God? One is to listen to the prophet Isaiah and to other biblical passages that remind us the path of the path of which we have to walk. The Ten Commandments, God's law. And the Beatitudes which you've heard which is often called the royal law of Jesus. Did you hear about the little girl in Sunday school? The teacher said, what are the Beatitudes? Ah, she said, I know. It's what Christians are supposed to be at. <laughs> and she was right. You know that, she was right. That's what we're supposed to be at, to do all of these things outlined so that we, we may be blessed. By blessed means deep down happy and joyous in knowing the love of God. Now the other thing we're supposed to do is to wrote, report to our probation officer regularly. <laughs> Always in residence. In other words, we're supposed to be in constant contact with God. We talk to God. We attend church, which is, by the way, our support group, right? We're wavering. Our friends in Christ stabilize us. When we're joyful, they share our joys. When we're tearful, they weep with us. This is our support group. And that's why I so often call this the family of faith. That is who we are. So church attendance is not really something we have to do. It's something we want to do. Because there we find positive things, we find wholeness, we find support and fellowship. We find the very things that remind us of who we're supposed to be. And look at the lives of others, we see it in action. And for that we give God thanks. And we talk with God, you know, that means prayer. Prayer means to take to God our true concerns. We have two prayers of confession in our service, as you notice. One is the one that applies to all of us. And the other done silently and privately is the one that God and we know needs to be prayed. That silent prayer is probably the most important one in the service. For it's then that we talk to God, and then having talked to God, we take a few minutes. And we start the process of learning how to listen for God. It happens in many ways. Maybe not a voice directly, but a true sense of what God would have us do. A deep down feeling of the knowledge of God's love, God's mercy, God's support of each one of us. And then we are supposed to practice our right living with, another with other probationers so that we can learn from one another the right paths in which to walk. And we're to study the guidebook for probationers the Bible. It's a guidebook. 
Here's our textbook in sense, but I like the guide because it shows us the ways in which to walk and where to walk humbly with our God. And then finally this. In the sense that God has reached out to us, we are called to reach out to others in service, in mission, in ministry. Probationers, welcome to the support group. Go forth from this place knowing that we are those who are not here because we have to, but because we want to be here. Let us thank God that we are Christian probationers, one and all. Let us pray. <coughs> oh God, we thank you. We thank you especially now that we gather around the Lord's table. For there we remember your great love for us. There we remember Christ's death for us. There we remember his presence with us always. Our souls are fed. We strengthen and go forth in his name to do his work. We thank you in Jesus our Lord. Amen.